In 1887, Allen Hill was told, there is no spiritual interest in Hammond, Indiana. But he didn't listen to that, and he started the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana anyway. Down through the years, the people of First Baptist have prayed and trusted that the Lord would give to us God's man. My name is Gail Merhalski, and I've attended First Baptist First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana since I was two weeks old, all of my life. I was here in 1959 when Brother Hiles became our new preacher. If you could have told us in 1959 all that we would have seen, all that the Lord would have allowed us to experience, the battles and the victories, we couldn't have comprehended it even if we could have believed it. And pastor's school? One pastor's school, much less 27 pastor's schools. Thank you for coming this year. There are some of us from 1959 who at this time especially would like to say thank you to you, not only for coming to this pastor's school, but also for being a friend to Brother Hiles, our preacher, and for being a friend to the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Let me interrupt just a moment. I sat down in my office one day and I wrote a little song. I don't know music, but I do know words, and I wrote a little song, my, my expression of thank you, and you'll hear it this week. It's a little song that I wrote, two stanzas, and I wrote the tune to it, but didn't know how to write a tune, so I just put some little dark spots up, one here and one up here means go up. One like here means go down. Elaine Colston uh, took the tune and the words, and she made an arrangement of it. It's my way and our way of saying thank you for being our friend.
joined this church in 1952 and when Brother House came here in 1959 a whole new world opened for me because he taught me something that I really hadn't used a lot of and that was love and how to be a friend and he's been my friend all these years he's been a friend when you think you don't have friends and you know I'd like to say thank you but so many times people use that word loosely. And I thought, how can I thank my pastor for having this pastor school? Because, you know, you sit down here and you don't see all these people, but now you look out and you think, my, how the Lord has blessed us for letting this many people come, just to come to First Baptist to learn what our pastor has to teach. I thought about the word thanks. T, I thought about your thoughtfulness and your love for us. For H, for the happiness you've brought us these 27 years to let us share with you some of the things that goes on here. For A, you've always been with us. You've never been against us. For N, it just seems like you never quit coming. You're always here for us. Then think of K. Will you just keep on keeping on? You come and you come. And we think, well, we can't hold anymore, but you still come. And then we thought of S. And that's how you have stood by us, how you have supported us, especially how you've stood by our pastor. He's the greatest pastor in the world. Amen. We love him. He's the best friend I ever had. He's the best friend you'll ever have. You put these things together and it does spell thanks. We would like to thank you tonight for coming. We love you. And this is from our heart. My name is Kathy Long. I was two years old when Brother Hiles came to First Baptist Church. My mom and my dad both grew up in the church here. I'm married and I have three children, and I hope my children will grow up in First Baptist Church too. So my family's been a part of this ministry for over 60 years. As a representative of this group of people who have been a part of First Baptist Church, all of Brother Hiles ministry, of course, we've had the privilege of seeing all 27 pastor schools. Each one is so special, so sweet, so warm, so unique. We feel that this pastor school is warm and special because we feel that you are here because you are supporting our preacher and our work here. I have a little boy who's almost 10 years old, 
And I would love for him to be able to stand up here 13 years from now, and he's a 23-year-old young man, at the 40th pastor school and say, I grew up at First Baptist Church. See, I think you're coming here this year and supporting our preacher and being a friend to our preacher has given him strength to continue our work. So that's why I think that possibly in 19, whatever it would be, uh, in the 40th pastor school, my son might be able to say, I grew up at First Baptist Church because you've been a friend to us and supported us and supported our preacher and given him strength to, to continue our work here. Thank you so much for coming to pastor school this year. Hi, my name is Ed Wolber, and I feel very, very honored to represent these precious people who have been my personal friends all my life. We would like to thank you so much for coming to our 27th pastor school and for being our friend and especially for being our preacher's friend. I've been here 61 years in this church and over a span of 61 years you gain a lot of wonderful friends who go through many, many things together, and they just don't quit. <laughs> We've been through a lot together. We've seen this church grow. I know it would be hard for some of you to understand this, but I can remember the days, and others of us here can remember the days when there were four and 500 people here. And now when we see the thousands, I just, I never want to have my heart get used to it. Amen. I thank you so much for, for coming and for being a part of what I think is the greatest church in all the world. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And those are the people that wouldn't have been a First Baptist Church, wouldn't have been a pastor school, had not been for those people who were here when I came 30, almost 31 years ago. And they've been a friend, friends all through these years. Sweet, lovely, wonderful people. Let's give them a hand. You'd have to understand, you'd have to understand that when, for them to even accept me 31 years ago was unbelievable. My predecessor preached in a scissor tail coat and striped breeches with a white boutonniere every Sunday. They had, would not allow a congregational song leader on Sunday morning. That was Sunday night. They wouldn't allow a piano on Sunday morning. It was the pipe organ. That's the kind that got all the mufflers up here over the, over the <laughs> choir. A big pipe organ, $50,000 pipe organ that one, one member gave to the church. That's all they allowed on Sunday morning. No songs about Jesus on Sunday morning. Only songs of the church on Sunday morning. You couldn't believe it. I came in here and started raising the devil. And uh, it's amazing. I have no idea. Dr. Tom Malone said, he called me on the phone. He said, I heard something. Don't think it's true. I said, what is it? He said, I heard a rumor that you're going. I was in Garland, Texas. He said, I heard a rumor, Brother Jack, that you're going to First Baptist Church of Hammond as pastor. He said, tell me it's not true. And I said, Dr. Tom, it is true. He said, he told me later. He said, when I heard that and knew it was true, I had been in that church one day on vacation. I had come by on a vacation and stopped there because it's First Baptist Church. And he said it was so formal. And knowing you like I do, Brother Jack, he said, I got a fever and chills and had to go to bed. <laughs> Just the thought of you pastoring that, that, that First Baptist Church of Hammond. So these people, have, I mean, they've, they've stayed through the stuff. Talking about staying through the stuff. Uh, somebody's been through an awful lot. But she stayed true like a, like a soldier. And she and I want to thank you for being our friends. Amen. We, I said to the staff today, 
I said, there are two times in my life where I felt like I felt at that moment, I feel it today, three times in my life. One was last night, all of these remember the last, last 12 hours, that's 24 hours. Last night, when we announced that yesterday, walking the aisles of First Baptist Church of Hammond, not in services away from here, but, but I'm talking about right here in our Hammond area, 5,099 people were dealt with personally, and we have their names and addresses, who received Christ as Savior. And I realize that that's the first time that that's happened anywhere in the world for 2,000 years. And I, I stood here last night. I did not know how many we had. I did not count them. All I did was t told our records department to take care of the records, and they gave me the, the results. And I had it folded when I stood to announce it. I did not know myself until I read it and announced it to the people. When I looked at that figure and realized that that many people had received Christ in one day. I, I said, there ought to be some kind of emotion you can show. But there's no emotion that you can show. I mean, what can you say about that? What do you do? You say amen. What do you say amen if a guy says something you agree with? I mean, uh, uh, well, you say hallelujah. Well, you say hallelujah because you're getting a free Big Mac or something. <laughs> what? And I, I absolutely, I, for, for, the, for, for the first time in my life, really, I felt totally incapable of saying thank you to God and of expressing my joy last night. I wanted to run around this auditorium. I want to take off my shoes and run down the street. But that wouldn't do it. I, I, there's no way. And I said to my staff this morning, I said, there's no way I can tell you right now how grateful I am for you. You have to understand this. 567 people are employed by the First Baptist Church of Hammond. We've lost one in the last year. One. And we lose more than that every year. One in the last year. So I'd like to say thank you, Mrs. Hiles and I, for being our friend and for standing beside us uh, this year. This little gal has been a real trooper. She really has. She's stood with the stuff. And we want to say together, thank you for being our friend. I do want to thank you. I, I would love to just take time to tell you how much these dear people who just went across the stage mean to us. and how that they've been so faithful through the years. But I would like to particularly thank you on behalf of our four children, their families, our 12 grandchildren who still have a future if the Lord tarries. And I hope a future of churches like some of you are building where they can hear the gospel preached in its purity and go soul winning and have the freedom that we enjoy today. A few years ago, my daughter Becky wrote several poems which she set to music. At that time, she did not know what the future held, but the message of this song has been particularly dear in the last year. It has been before that, but particularly this last year. It has been particularly a blessing to her, as in the last few months, she has become quite ill with the disease of lupus. Now let me say this, I realize that not only have we had some heartaches, but some of you have come here with heartaches. Yeah. And just as you are, have been our friend, we want you to know we are your friend. We want to be your friend, and we want to know, you to know we are your friend. And I want you to take the message of this song to your heart. You may need it tonight.
until the sun comes out and makes my life look new. The sun will shine again, the sun will shine, as sure as night brings day, joy will be mine. Dark clouds may hover, but soon will pass away. The sun will shine again and bring a bright new day. Becky wrote that song. She was not ill. And uh, it was a great blessing to me when she wrote it and to Mrs. Hiles. And little did she know that she would have to make that song the testimony of her life because of her disease. This, let me just say this to you. The sun will shine again. Amen. And your burdens are as big as ours. But let Becky and Mrs. Hiles remind you of it. God will stay with me and calm my fears until the sun comes out and dries my stormy tears. The sun will shine. to yours. Thank you for being our friend. My name is Pam Hibbard, and I represent Hammond City Baptist High School and Grade School. <laughs> Hammond City Baptist is a school for bus kids, bus kids that we call the overcomers that live in Chicago. There's no way that we can really say thank you. So many times during the year we've seen the, the love that Preacher has shown to us, but more than that, we haven't seen across America, but we've heard of the love that you've shown to our Preacher. City Baptist High School is here today because of you. 30 years ago, I think it was on a Thursday evening, Brother Hiles came to my house one night, and I didn't understand it, but he talked to my dad, and, and I can remember, I didn't understand it, but I watched my dad kneel at the couch with Preacher, and my dad just cried and cried, and I didn't know that that would be the beginning of what would change my life. I love First Baptist Church, and we as a school could not exist if it were not for the people in this room. So many times I've walked the halls of our school, and, and I thank God so much for our preacher, but thank you so much for you who've stood behind our preacher through the year. About 13 years ago, we had a group of teenagers who were coming from Chicago. They were coming on Sunday morning. They were coming again on Sunday night. They were staying on Sunday afternoon, but, and they were excited. They were going out sewing, but it wasn't enough. 
And I can remember they would come to us and we would talk about a Christian school and we would dream and hope and dream and hope and we would go to our knees and beg God for something that seemed impossible. And I'll never forget one day when preacher called me in. I knew it was something exciting, but I didn't know what it was. Someone had said, you're going to be excited, and that was all they told me. And when I went in, he said, Pam, we're going to start at Christian school. Amen. And I wouldn't trade places with anyone in the world. We have, we have at City Baptist a group of teenagers out of Chicago. Last week I was in Chicago, and I walked into one of the buildings. And there's no way to describe what it's like. You walk into a dark hallway with half of the steps missing and you walk all the way up and you find a door left partly open with no light or electricity. And you find that one of our City Baptist teenagers lived there and they're so glad you came to their house. And there's, I want to say thank you to you in here. I love our preacher and I love our church and I love you for being what our preacher needed through the year. You lifted up his hands, you, you helped strengthen him, and he came on Sunday and strengthened us so much during the year and, and assured us that everything was fine, and it's because of your love for him, and thank you. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Hernandez, and I'm a senior at City Baptist this year. This is my second year attending City Baptist. I don't exactly know everything that's gone on the past year, but I know that without your love and support, to our preacher and to our church that there may have not been a City Baptist for me to attend or even a Hiles Anderson College for me to attend in the future. Amen. I love this church and I love our preacher and I just want to thank you very much for giving the, us, me the opportunity to attend a school like City Baptist and to have the surrounding, surrounding the, all this love that surrounds me now and I just want to thank you for being our friend. My name is Dave Douglas. I work as the administrator of Hammond City Baptist School. The young lady that you just heard represents one of nearly 200 students. If there's one thing that all of us at City Baptist have in common, that is that we love our preacher and we're very thankful that you supported him this past year. Literally, for many of our students, our school means survival to them. To others, it means a stepping stone to Hiles Anderson College and the full-time ministry. I want to introduce you to 200 young people who are very, very thankful that you stood behind our preacher and this church. but I wrote a poem to them and I'm going to read the poem to you kids so just look right this way if you would kids I want to read it to you this poem not only be read tonight but it's going to be in your yearbook this year or when the, the yearbook for this year it's called You're My Youngins Too You may not know her mama is or even know your dad a foster mother may just be the only mom you've had. Your family's, uh, your, uh, your mommy's not, 
Your mom does not teach Sunday school. Your dad's not on the board. And clothes that come from hand-me-downs are all you can afford. You may not have a normal home or happy family. You may not like your heritage or know your family tree. But I don't care where you came from, but where you're going to. I'm mighty proud to call you mine because you're my youngins too. You may not have a pretty house like do the rest of us. You do not ride a car to church. You ride a bumpy bus. I'm not concerned how you arrive, but I'm sure glad you do. You're real important around this place because you're my youngins too. You may not dress with fancy clothes like other young folks do, but you look great to Brother Hiles. He loves you through and through. I'm not concerned about fancy dress. I'm just concerned about you. I'm mighty proud to be your friend because you're my youngins too. You may be of another race, like brown or black or white, but you're as loved as anyone in your old preacher's sight. Because I don't care what race you are. I love you. Yes, I do. I'm glad that I'm your preacher man because you're my youngins too. You may have done a lot of wrong, but some kids have not known. But you've been washed in Jesus' blood. So you too are his own. I don't care what you once were or what you once went through. I only care that you're mine because you're my youngins too. You may have fear of all the gangs who roam your neighborhood. You may not have the kind of house that you oft wish you could. You may not have a pretty yard where you can run and play. You can't go to a private room where you alone can stay. You do not know the coziness when, at the end of day, to nestle on your daddy's knee and hear him kindly say, and hear him kindly say, I love you, and I'm glad you're mine, then see him bow to pray. You look at other people's homes and wish yours were that way. But there's a place where you can go and feel as loved as I. You're just as loved as anyone at City Baptist High. And when you walk First Baptist halls, another guy loves you. You're loved by your old preacher man, cause you're my youngins, too. Uh, you folks that are visiting with us, this kind of stuff goes on all the time here. Our, our people are, our people are idiots. That's what they are. <laughs> Craziest thing you ever saw in your life. Somebody gets saved from the bus mini, uh, from the city Baptist school, and they all throw a fit. And somebody gets saved in the public school ministry, and the public school kids go wild. And and uh, well. It's time to vote. We, we ask you to come here, and your presence is a vote. And so it's time to vote tonight. Tonight, we're going to cast our vote, regardless of what a bunch of sub, uh, 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 substitute preachers say, imitation preachers say. We're going to cast our vote for the blood. For the blood. Our vote. We vote. For the blood of Christ. <laughs> then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Go out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Strike the lintel on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, upon the two side posts, the Lord will pass over. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is, it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your souls. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. This is the blood of the testament which, the, which God hath enjoined unto you. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for its purchase of our salvation. Thank you for our great crowd tonight, for these dear people. But thank you, especially for the redemption price, the shed blood of our precious Savior. In his name, amen. I gave some thought. I gave... I gave some serious thought. Brother Parks is one of our members, and I gave some serious thought sending him out to John MacArthur. And <laughs> seeing if he couldn't look down on him and convince him of the blood. <laughs> I, uh, my old pastor, years ago, he went to, to a meeting with his son and my pastor was way up in years, and, and uh, he's sitting there with a meeting, and this guy got up and said, uh, the Bible is not, uh, you can't really depend on the Bible. We don't know all the manuscripts and where they came from and so forth. You can't depend on the Bible. So we just want you to know that we believe the Bible, but, but we can't depend on every word of it. My old pastor leaned over and patted his son on the knee, and he said, son, that, what that fellow's saying is true, as far as he knows. When Mr. John MacArthur says the blood is still at the, in, the, in the ground at the base of Calvary, I think he's telling the truth, as far as he knows. <laughs> I have one more item to bring on the platform, and uh, I guess you know what this is, don't you? That's the brazen altar. That's, that's exactly the dimensions of the brazen altar. And... Uh, they, they took an ox on the Day of Atonement and killed it. Jack Patterson, are you available? Yeah. <laughs> While we bring the other piece of furniture, we'll sing There's Power in the Blood. We're going to have a little Bible study. Be, be seated, please. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. You folks over here, We'll have to take by faith that I'm good looking, <coughs> but we're indebted to our shop, wood shop teacher at Hammond Baptist High School. I lost his name all of a sudden. Yoder, yeah, Brother Yoder. Brother Yoder for making these for us. There's no way we could have the entire tabernacle or the court, of course, but these are the two main pieces of furniture I want to talk about tonight. This is the brazen altar where the sacrifice was given, offered. And this is, of course, the Ark of the Covenant on top of which is the mercy seat. 
and uh, the beaten cherubim there uh, with their wings hovering over the mercy seat. Now we're going to have a little Bible study. We're preaching later on in the week, but tonight I want to give you a Bible study. I think it'll enlighten you. Our Heavenly Father, we come to the Word of God tonight, and I want to do it justice, and I pray you to help me as I teach. And help us on this first night of pastor school as we think of the blood. We vote for the blood tonight. Help us as we study about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 20, verse number 17. I want you to follow along with me very carefully now. We're going to read a lot of several verses in the Bible, numbers of verses tonight. I want you to follow with me as I do. And from Miletus, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. All right, I want you to look at me for a minute. The elders of the church. Now, it says the elders of the church. Now, what church is talking about? It's talking about the church at Ephesus. I'll, I'll, uh, because it says the elders of the church. He's Miletus. He sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. The word church there is the word ecclesia in the Bible, which it almost always is, which means a called out assembly. So this was a local body of believers, and by the way, I'll be saying more about this during the week, but as far as I'm concerned, that's the only church there is today, the local assembly. The doctrine of the universal church uh, was started by the Catholic church, which means universal, and from that came it came down to the Protestants, from the Protestants it came down to the non-denominational group, and they have spread, though there are some good people in that group. They've given us the Schofield Bible and other things that have given us error. The Baptist people, uh, originally we were called Anabaptists, and as far back as 1,015, 1,600 years ago, they were fighting for the doctrine of opposing the universal and invisible church and for the doctrine of the local church. And so it says here, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders, now that's the word pastors, there are three uh, meaning, three words that mean the same thing in the Bible, have this do with the same office. One is elder, one is pastor, and one is bishop. Each of those words define the same office. One office, the uh, word elder, means that the pastor is supposed to have wisdom and guide the people in wisdom and counsel. And then the word bishop, which means overseer, means the pastor is supposed to oversee everything. I'd like for you little peanut head preachers to get that while you're here. Those of you whose board members lead you around and, and when you they say jump, you ask how high. I'd like for you to understand that while you're here. It'd be a wonderful opportunity if you become a man while you're here. We can have, we can have a, a uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know how to word it without being vulgar, but uh, we can change your, we can change your gender while you're here. Uh, and uh, there are other words that surgeons call it, but I can't use that in the pulpit. But uh, so the one word for the word pastor is the word elder, which means wisdom, counsel, love. The word bishop is the second word, which means oversee the entire program. Doesn't mean you're the dictator, it just means folks will think you act like one, that's all. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the, um, and I say that with the chairman of my deacon sitting right behind me on the platform tonight. And he'll say amen to it. Amen. He just said amen to it. <laughs> and it took him a while, but he came across, came around to it. But there's a third word for the word pastor, and that's the word pastor itself. The word pastor meaning shepherd, the one who protects the sheep, the one who feeds the sheep, the one who guides the sheep, and the one who skins. But anyway, uh, the uh, so when it says that that from Miletus he sent to Ephesus. <coughs> and call for the elders of the of the church. He's talking about the elders of that the pa pastors. Like we have men on the platform, we have a multiplicity of pastors. <laughs> there I go. Multiplicity. It's, it's a Greek word that I just use all over and over and over again. And when you're a chancellor of a college, you use a lot of Greek words like that. Multiplicity and catty cornered and catty wampus and and uh, I just can quote it just like that over and over and over again. And but I've got to I've got to get down to your level. Uh, I'm not sure even I can do that. But anyway, now so Paul called for the elders, the pastors of the church. Now look down to verse number 28. Paul said, "Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, 
over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. There's that word bishop there, the word overseer. And uh, now all the flock, okay. Now what church was it uh, that was their flock? The church at what? Tell me out loud. The church at Ephesus, a local church. Not talking here about the universal church. You wouldn't talk about it because not a such thing. You see, all Christians don't form a church. All Christians will someday form a church because the word church means a called out assembly. And all Christians have never yet been called out to assemble. And they will not be called out to assemble until the rapture. And according to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23, then they'll be the church, become the church of the firstborn, assembled or churched, if you please, in heaven. And they'll be in heaven. And then, and only then, will all Christians form the church. I make a big issue out of that because there are a lot of people floating around that think the church, local church, and that's the only kind there is, is a mighty cute thing. And if some people haven't grown in the Lord a great deal where they can join the youth of Christ, they can belong to a local church. And uh, so... Uh, uh, they can they can join anything that uh, but if you can if you can't get promoted to the invisible church then you can uh, you can belong to the uh, local church and that's mighty cute for we, we Christians to do um, the truth is it's very strange when these invisible church people want to raise money they always contact us in us visible churches to raise their money and it's a very strange thing now I make an issue out of this because I want to Now, so look at verse number 28 again. Take heed, therefore. You know, normally we make you mad on Wednesday. I decided to start off right off the bat this time. And uh, so, uh, and to think, you get paid for this lamb, you pay for this lambasting. You paid $40 today for this chewing out I'm giving you tonight. 45 That's because you rascals didn't pre-register. You didn't decide soon enough to come. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock of which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, that's the flock at Ephesus, to feed the church of God. Well, I'll declare. What church are you talking about? I'm talking about the church at Ephesus up in verse 17. He told what church he's talking about. He said, feed the church of God. That's not an invisible universal church. That's the local church at Ephesus over which, uh, <coughs> uh, over which, uh, the church of God, which hath purchased with his own blood. Now, for right now, I want you to notice the term his own blood. Now, what did Jesus purchase with his blood here? He purchased the local church with his own blood right here. He's talking about the local church. He said, the church over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And he said, that was the church at Ephesus, the called out assembly at Ephesus. So Jesus purchased that church with his own blood. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that more was purchased on Calvary than just your salvation. Uh, turn, if you would, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 53. Very famous <coughs> Isaiah, chapter 53. Verse number four. I want you to notice, as you already know, that more was purchased on Calvary than just your salvation. This Isaiah 53, of course, is the Calvary book of the Old Testament, one of them. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. All right, look at me. Jesus bore on the cross our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, what does that mean? That means we don't have to grieve. We don't have to sorrow. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4 and said, I write that you sorrow not as those which have no hope. So there, 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 there's a sorrow, and there is a Christian uh, sorrow. But it's not sorrow as the world has. I was at the airport one day. I go out early to the airport sometimes and see if I can do some minister to some people. And um, I saw a couple weeping. Uh, uncontrollably weeping and I went over and I said could I help you please I'm a Baptist preacher and uh, the man said well yes it said our daughter's going back to uh, his daughter going back to college and and we hate to see her go and in fact she's going to college 
and for the first time, and we hate to see her go. But she's going to be home in a few months, and we know that, but we're still going to miss her. We hate to see her go. I prayed with them, walked down the uh, concourse a while, a bit further, farther. I saw another couple weeping uncontrollably. And I walked over and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor, Baptist preacher. And I said, could I help you? And they said, yes. See that girl right there? She's getting on the plane, giving the ticket, a boarding pass to the wait to the tourists. She said, the man said, that's our daughter. Says she's dying with cancer. She's come home for a visit. And this is probably the last time we'll ever see her. Now, in those two cases is the, what I'm talking about right here. Jesus died to keep us from having the last. We sorrow as the child goes off to college, but we don't sorrow as one that has no hope. My mother's in heaven. When she, when she, when she went to heaven, I sorrowed, but not as those that have no hope. So Jesus on the cross, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now look at verse on. on. Yet... We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. I don't have time to explain that God was the one that had to see to it that Jesus satisfied God's holiness and righteousness on the cross. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our, chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we're healed. Now, <clears throat> you have <clears throat> here in the atonement, you have more than Jesus dying just for our sins. He died for our health. He died for our healing. He died for our sorrows. He died for our griefs. He died for our sins, but he also, with that same blood, purchased his body, the local church, on the cross of Calvary. He paid the price for the local church. Now, go back to Acts 20:28 20, again, would you please? Acts 20:28 20, again. I want to read that and pick out one little line and, uh, and uh, go from there. Acts 20, 28 again. It's the same place that it was a while ago. <laughs> Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. I want you to notice that little line which he hath purchased purchased. The blood of Jesus was the purchase price for our salvation and for the purchasing of the church, which is the body in the sense that he owns. It's his body. This church is owned by Jesus Christ. He is the head of this church, and the word head there means potentate. He's the high and holy master of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. He is the boss man. He is the foreman. He's the guy that owns it. He bought it, and so it's his, his own body, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, <coughs> there are two things. I'm getting to the, what I want to tell you. There are two things necessary for a purchase. Let's suppose for a few moments, uh, Brother Ray Broadway here works at Nipsco. That's the Northern Indiana Public Service Company. That's our uh, public utility company here in Northwest Indiana. Now, they send us a bill every month, and we send them a check every month. Now, let's, there's two things. Uh, <laughs> there are two things. Uh, we should have said amen as quickly a while ago. <laughs> but uh, there, there are two things that, that are necessary for the payment or the purchasing of something. Number one, you've got to write out the check. And number two, you've got to take it to the right place. Let's suppose I get my bill from Nipsco here, and here's my bill from Nipsco, and I'm, I write a check out here. I'm sitting at my desk, and I write a check, Northern Indian Public Service, uh, $3,242 for one month of uh, electricity so I can pay this guy's salary up here. And then, so I write the check. Okay, the check is written, is that right? So I pull my drawer out here, put the check in the door, and the bill is paid. It's all cared for, isn't it? Now it's paid. No, the check is not paid until, our uh, bill's not paid until the price is paid and until the price is placed at the right place. If the price is not at Northern, at Nipsco, then the, the bill is not paid. I can leave that price on my desk. I can take that price home. I can put that price in the garbage can. I can pay that price all I want to. But bless your little pea-picking heart, we've got to get that check to the right place at Nipsco, or I still owe Nipsco. Now then, 
I'm saying if Jesus paid the price, purchased us with his blood, there are two things he had to do. Number one, he had to pay the price. Number two, the price had to be put at the right place. You see? So it takes more than just the price. Mr. MacArthur says that the blood of Jesus, may I have this microphone here, please? That the blood of Jesus, um, this, this is the brazen altar on which the sacrifice was made, and uh, that the sacrifice was made, and the blood dripped down through and neath uh, the, uh, 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 there at the cross of Calvary. And when Jesus, on our brazen altar, which is Calvary, on a piece of wood, just like this piece of wood, uh, judging sin and becoming our sin for us, uh, Mr. MacArthur says that that blood, uh, Jesus, was there at the foot of the cross and still is at the foot of the cross. Mr. MacArthur, I'd like to announce to you that you wrote the check out, but you didn't send it to Nipsco. I mean, the blood of Jesus that sprinkled uh, there at the foot of the cross won't save anybody. The blood of Jesus has got to not only be, the price has got to be paid, but it must be taken over here and sprinkled on the mercy seat or you and I are headed for hell. No wonder Mr. MacArthur's wrong on salvation. He's wrong on the blood. It's not just the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, but not the blood there, the blood there. And so Jesus paid on the Calvary. He purchased not only our, follow this, our eternal home in heaven with his blood, but he purchased our temporary home on earth. He said, I, I've got a place where I want you to live in heaven someday. I'm purchasing that with my blood. But he said, while you're on your way to heaven, I want you to live around the church house most of the time. And I'm going to purchase that with the same blood of, of Calvary, the local church. But it was not, and by the way, you say, Brother Howe, it's a matter of semantics. It's a matter of heresy. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a matter of words. We'll say the right ones then. Well, uh, uh, but we misunderstand him. Anybody here misunderstanding me? He's got the same dictionary I've got. Let him pick out the words. I thought that's what a preacher is supposed to do is be understood. I thought the purpose of preaching was to convey a thought from here to there. You haven't got enough sense to use the right words. Get out of the pulpit. Let somebody has got some brains get in the pulpit. You say, boy, I didn't know what I got into here. I want you to know tonight so you can go home through the night. I vote for the blood. I vote for the blood. And one of the great purposes of this meeting is to raise our banner high and say it's time that fundamentalists voted not just for the blood at the foot of Calvary, but the blood on the mercy seat. So, consequently... We've noticed that Jesus purchased, by the way, notice in Acts 20, 28 again, said he purchased it with his, said, said the, the, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Whose blood? God's blood. Oh, that was no man's blood that went through the veins of Jesus. No, that was God's blood. It said, feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Don't you see Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And the reason man dies is because man has bad blood. When man sinned, death came, and death came in the blood. And so the blood that flowed through Jesus' veins was not the blood like it flows through my veins and yours, but it was God's blood. God's blood. God's blood. He had purchased with his own blood. Now, are we settled about two or three things? In the first place, Jesus purchased our salvation, our eternal home, and our tabernacle to travel in, our local church where we're supposed to serve and be faithful on our way to heaven. And that he purchased it with God's blood, not his blood, not our blood, God's blood. And that that blood... The purchase price must be paid and deposited at the right place. Now, don't, don't lose me now. Don't lose me now. Uh, 
who, to whom do you pay a debt? Well, you pay the person to whom you owe the debt. And when man sinned the Garden of Eden, a holy, righteous, just God said, the soul that sinneth it must die. And the wages of sin is death. And God turned his back upon man because man had turned his back upon God. But because of God's great mercy, God had to have his justice satisfied. That's why join the church can't save you. Because join the church does not satisfy the righteousness of God and the justice of God. That's why being baptized can't save you. Because baptism does not satisfy the holiness and righteousness and justice of Almighty God. God, within his love and mercy, when, kids, when judgment and mercy kissed each other, there on the cross, Jesus paid the penalty and paid the price for our sins in his own body and shed the blood, the payment price. But to whom do the blood owed? The blood is owed to the Heavenly Father. That's what Jesus didn't die for you primarily. He died first for God. He didn't die so you come back to God. First he died so God would take you back, could take you back if you came. First thing he did was die for you so God could take you back and still be God. If God took you back because you lived a good life, God would not be God and the stars would fall in their sockets tonight. The heavens would, would fall and the whole universe would be out of socket. Be no God. Why? Because if God took you back without justice, God would not be a just God. And without justice, our God is a sinner. Well, then, if the price must be paid, and if it must be taken to a certain place, where is that place? Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, there it is again, he entered in once. That's all Jesus had to go in. I mean, a high priest went in three times a year on the Day of Atonement, and, uh, and, and three times that one time, the Day of Atonement, and he had to go in every year three times like that. Once for his own sins and once for the sins of the people. Atonement. And once for the burnt offering on the day of atonement. But it said once. He entered in once into the holy place. Now follow me carefully. The lamb or the, or the goat was slain on the altar. But that blood could not stay on the altar. It must be taken by the high priest and be sprinkled on the mercy seat, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Inside that Ark of the Covenant, you had the, the Aaron's rod that budded, a golden pot of manna, and the tablets of stone that God had given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And the, 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 the glory of God dwelt right up here. And that blood was sprinkled on that mercy seat. And that's the place. Now that was the place where the lamb's blood had to be sprinkled. Or the goat's blood had to be sprinkled. Now there is also in heaven. This mercy seat right here is only a symbol of the one that was in, in, in the wilderness. And the one in the wilderness was only a symbol of the one that's in heaven. You know what you're doing tonight? You're seeing something tonight. Just like they're looking at in heaven right now. Because the one in heaven was the pattern from which the one in the wilderness was made. And the one in the wilderness was the pattern which this was made. So the high priest came. The high priest. He first took off his high priestly garments. <coughs> and came just in white linen. And the first thing the high priest did. He took the life of the innocent substitute. And then the blood from that innocent substitute, there are many things concerning this that we'll bypass, such as the coals from the altar and so forth. 
But he took the blood from the innocent substitute. He walked inside through the veil between the court and the holy place itself. And on the left, there was the golden candlestick. On the right was the table of showbread. And right before him was the altar of incense. And then just behind the altar of incense was a big veil. The same one, bless God, that was torn in two when Jesus himself went to the cross. And the high priest would walk inside that veil and stand there in the very presence of the glory of God. And on that mercy seat would sprinkle the blood of the Lamb. And while he stands there, our Savior went to a brazen altar called Calvary. He died as my high priest, I mean, as my, as my uh, sacrifice, my goat, my lamb. But that isn't enough. Don't you recall what Paul said in Romans? He said, we are saved by his life. Jesus' death is not enough. He died as a lamb, but he had to rise as a high priest. Because somehow we've got to get the blood right in there. We've got to get it over there or all of us are going to go to hell. Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood. And then he rose after 72 hours as the, as the high priest. He started walking toward the Holy of Holies in heaven, the real one where God is tonight. And all of a sudden, since he was the high priest, he could not be touched by the hands of men. Because this man could not be touched by the hands of men between the time he got that blood and the time he sprinkled that blood. So Jesus was walk on his way from Calvary to the Holy of Holies and to the mercy seat in heaven. And all of a sudden he saw Mary. Oh, well, how Mary loved him. He had saved her from a life of ruin and wreck. She had been possessed of seven devils. And oh, she loved him. And there was her resurrected Savior. Don't you know she wanted to reach out and say, let me see if that's really you, Jesus. And Jesus said, oh, 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 Mary. No, 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 Mary. Don't, don't touch me. Don't touch me, Mary. I've not yet ascended to my father. What was he saying? He's saying, I'll spill this blood if you don't watch out, Mary. He's saying, i got to get to heaven with this blood. And if I get touched by the hands of men, before I get to the altar, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, golden, I'm sorry, the, uh, what is this? Mercy seat in heaven and sprinkle my blood on that mercy seat. Then my payment on, on the cross will be invalid. He said, I've got to get it there. Now you listen to me. The very blood that was shed there on the cross, that very blood was taken by my wonderful Savior and it was put on the mercy seat. And tonight, at this very moment, God the Father is looking at it and he cannot see my sins because they're beneath that blood right there. Not just the blood of the cross, but the blood of the mercy seat. Let's go through it. We're going to go through it again. Go back up there where you were. We'll just let you start from the first. We'll go through it again. All right? He comes in. You go right ahead on your own. He comes in. He kills the lamb. He takes the blood of that lamb. Watch what he does with it. Where are you going? Hey, where are you going? Have you cracked up? That must be John MacArthur in a white robe. <laughs> night of the Passover the Jews were told had been told back yonder a few days before to choose a lamb for every household 
God said to Moses, you tell every head of every household to choose a lamb. On the tenth day of the first month, let him choose that lamb. It must be a male lamb. It must be a male lamb without blemish. You let him choose that male lamb and keep it up for four days. After he's kept it up for four days and proved that lamb was without blemish, you take that lamb, tell, tell the head of the household to take that lamb and kill it. And, and let him take a hyssop weed and take that blood in a basin from that lamb that was killed, let's say, in the backyard. And you go out on the front porch of the house and you take that blood and hyssop weed and dip it in that blood in the basin and sprinkle that blood on the doorpost and on the lintels of the house. And on the night of the 14th, the death angel is going to pass over. Every house that does not have the blood applied will have the firstborn taken in death. Can you imagine how careful every father was? He put his little child to bed at night, his oldest child to bed at night, and thought, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, this has got to work. Bless God, the blood always works, folks. This has got to work. And so he chooses that lamb. He's careful that it's a male lamb without blemish. He watches that little lamb, watches it for four days, carefully to observe if it's a fit sacrifice. He takes that lamb and he kills that lamb out in the backyard. He goes in the house and says, everything's all right. No, it's not all right. You paid the price, sir, but you didn't make it to Nipsco. You put, you put the check in the drawer. The blood shed of that lamb is not enough. It is not the blood in the backyard. It's the blood on the doorpost. Hey, get back in here. Do it right this time. You ought to be ashamed. The high priest has laid aside his royal priestly garments. Comes like Jesus did, laying aside his robe of deity. Taking upon himself the form of human nature. He kills the lamb. He takes the blood. He goes to the mercy seat and sprinkles that blood on the mercy seat. Praise God. Hallelujah! The blood is applied. Atonement is made. Thank God. Hallelujah. Three cheers. I vote for the blood. Now, that blood that you saw sprinkled, it's God's blood, we learn. It purchased not only our eternal home, but it purchased the church as Jesus' own body. He owns it himself. But the blood not only had to be shed, but it had to be applied where it was owed. Amen. And that's in the presence of the Father. And so tonight, the blood of Jesus at this very moment, is sprinkled neath the vision of Jehovah God. Now you say, I don't think that's important. Well, you're going to say that in hell one of these days, too, if you don't think that's important. A lot of folks in hell didn't think the blood was important. You, do you think that if God gave us the type in the tabernacle as a pattern, pattern after the heavenly, do you think that God would give us an imperfect type? That lamb's blood that was shed must be there on the mercy seat. Well, what's it doing there? Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that's that blood was sprinkled over a while ago, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now I want you to notice the word speaketh, that's in the present tense. Speaketh. Speaketh. Whenever Paul or whoever wrote, I think Paul wrote Hebrews, 
he did nothing, Barnabas did, and if he did nothing, Silas did, and if he didn't, I think John R. Rice did. I'm not sure. <laughs> but probably Paul wrote Hebrews. He said, the blood of sprinkling that speaketh. Let me remind you, this was written in 65 A.D., 30 some odd years after the blood of Jesus was shed. And the blood, after 35 years, was still talking. Still talking. Let me read you a verse. You don't need to turn to it. I want to read you a verse very familiar to you. He said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. What God say? God said, Cain, that's talking blood Abel had. That blood's talking to me from the ground. Talking to God. Well, if Abel's blood can talk to God, I bet you Jesus' blood could talk to God. If human blood can speak, I bet God's blood has pretty good vocabulary. It's talking. It's talking. It's speaking. 35 years after it was shed, it's still speaking. And it's speaking. And then it says in the verse I read from Genesis 4.10, it said, God said his blood is speaking unto me. He said, I never heard any blood speak. Only God hears speaking blood. What's that blood saying? <laughs> that blood is talking right in the presence of God tonight, saying, Hey, Father, uh, I'm the blood of Jesus. Uh, see if you can see old Hiles' sins. Father said, What sins are you talking about? <laughs> blood said, they're covered by me. They're covered by me. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, after 2,000 years, still speaks. Bless God, I vote for the blood. I vote for the blood. And brother, what we've said tonight needs to be preached from every pulpit in the land. We got too much power positive stinking going on these days. Possibility stinking. Not enough old fashioned blood preaching. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Brother Christmas Evans, the old famous old preacher, died, was on his deathbed. A group of young preachers gathered around his body as the old man was ebbing away, life on earth ebbing away, and uh, the glory land getting a little bit clearer. He was asked by the young preachers, Mr. Evans, what words would you say to young preachers if you only had one word to say before you die? The last words the old man said was, young men, preach the blood in the basin. Now, he just didn't say preach the blood. He didn't say preach the blood in the altar. Preach the blood in the basin on the way to the mercy seat. Daniel Webster was dying. They asked him what he'd like to have done before he died. The old man, Daniel Webster, is a pretty good-sized fellow, they said, and he raised his body up for the last time. He said, I'd like for you to sing, There's a fountain filled with blood. And as he went to heaven, they sang, There is a fountain filled with blood. And then they got down in the last stanza. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Christmas Evans raised himself up one last time with his weak arms, his old big old body. And as they sang that stanza, he said, Amen. Amen. The dying thief rejoiced to see. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I wonder tonight 
How long has it been since you preached on the blood? Oh, you say, preacher, I believe everything you said tonight about that, bra that brazen altar and that mercy seat. How long has it been since you preached on it? Why don't you give yourself anew to the blood? It bothers me that some of you preachers are not mad because somebody's making light of the blood. It bothers me that you start to defend a person like that. It bothers me that you wouldn't want somebody to shout to the housetops about the blood of Christ sprinkled on the heavenly mercy seat. That bothers me. Oh, for some old-fashioned preachers again. Old-timey, leather-long men of God who take the book as it is and not as some professor taught them in some backslidden seminary. Promise God tonight you're going to get back to the blood. And while our heads are bowed, why don't you just say tonight to, G to Jesus, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the blood. Our Heavenly Father. It's hard for us to understand all about this. I've read several times in the last few days all the Bible has to say about Day of Atonement. Far more complicated than we made it, but the main thing was the blood got from the veins of the Lamb to the mercy seat of the ark. And I don't understand all about the blood of Christ, but it got from his veins to heaven's mercy seat. And there it is tonight. Thank you for it. Amen. I said last night, that man, Luke chapter 18, had never done it, that never done anything good, I guess, much. He's a publican. And they never did much anything good. No pictures now, right now, please. This other guy fasted and prayed, was clean. A Pharisee, religious man, observed the ritual and the ordinances. This poor old publican was a dirty, rotten sinner, extortioner, crook, thief, robber. In fact, the word there, extortioner, in play, is, is a word that means robber, taking, taking something by force in that, that word. Well, what was the difference? What got that guy to heaven? One word, one, one sentence. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You can take any reference Bible you want to take, and you'll find that that word merciful there is the Greek word that deals with the mercy seat. What he said was, Lord, be mercy seat merciful to me, a sinner. What he said was, Lord, I've been around this place a long time. I've been watching all this. I know all this stuff goes on. I said, Lord, that, 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 that thing, that, 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 that deal about the brazen altar and that, that high priest goes inside that spooky place by himself and, and he comes back out and he hollers, it's finished. And I said, Lord, whatever that stuff means, he said, would you be merciful to me like that? What he was saying was, you be mercy seat merciful. You be blood merciful to me, a sinner. When our Savior was about to go back to heaven, he called his disciples, apostles, to the upper room. You remember the story? Those immortal words, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And on and on, that marvelous 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. Close the back door, please. And uh, the marvelous story there of the upper room. When Jesus girded himself and washed the disciples' feet. But now wait a minute. He took a little cup and he said, fellows, there's something I want you to remember. He said, I want you to remember my blood. And I want you not only to remember the blood, but remember the flesh through which it poured. The whole thing was the blood. He said, remember the flesh through which it poured. I won't go into this, but you go over tonight to Zechariah chapter 13, along about verse 6 or 7 there. And you'll have the story of the millennium. He's talking about the millennium. And Jesus is there in the kingdom age in the millennium. And Jesus says, see my wounds. That's in the thousand year reign. See my wounds. But Jesus, I thought there were scars. Oh, no. No. We're saying, have you failed in your plan? 
of your storm-tossed life. Place your hand in the nail, no, not the nail-scarred hand. No, the nail-wounded hand. In the kingdom age, you won't see scars. You will see fresh wounds on the hands of the Savior. Why? Huh. I tell our people we observe the Lord's Supper. My folks will tell you it's one of my, the highlights of my month is the Lord's Supper. And that Jesus said, in the kingdom age, I'm going to serve it to you. Can you imagine him taking the cup and passing it to you? And you see those wounds in his hands. Jesus said, don't forget my blood. Fellas, don't make light of the Lord's Supper. Don't have it casually. Don't put it on the tail end of a service with nothing else to do. Or 11.15 on watch night service after you've had your fun and your movie. Make it a big deal. Why? Because it's, it's, it's the blood. You holler amen about the blood and then don't have the Lord suffer once every six months. Now, you may have a conviction about once every six months, once every year. But I'm saying whenever you have it, make a big deal out of it. I try everything I do here. I try to make it as big as it really is. And uh, when I have a wedding and mar marry one of our lovely young ladies to one of our fine young men. I try to make every wedding something very, very special. And I'm very complimented when people come to me and say, Brother Hiles, that's the most beautiful wedding I've ever seen. A Jewish attorney came to one of our weddings recently. He made it away, away to my office and he said, Reverend, he said, that's the most beautiful wedding my wife and I've ever seen. And I love that. When I stand here and lay to rest, conduct the services, for one of our dear members who's gone to heaven, the body is here before me. I, by the way, all the funerals I preach are from right behind this pulpit from the church. I think I want to get the funerals back in the church house. But anyway, uh, I stand right here and preach the funeral. I do everything I can. You ask my people. I, I study more for a funeral sermon than I do for my Sunday morning sermons. No joke. Always do. Because I, wanna, I want it to be the most comforting funeral ever known. And when people say, Brother Hiles, that funeral was the sweetest I've ever seen, the most comforting, it does something for me. But I got a letter the other day from a lady in our church named Mrs. Ramsey, one of the saints of our church. She said, Dear Brother Hiles, I love you. I love your preaching. I thank God for you for all these years you've been my preacher. But she said to me, the thing that you do that does the most for me, is she said, you perform the most personal, meaningful, spiritual Lord's Supper I've ever seen performed. And I read the letter and I said, that's what I want. Because that's the time I'm reminding my people of the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the blood. I vote for the blood. Not just there, but over there.